Maxim. Uh, Maxim Spirnov from uh, Germany, Augsburg and Bonn, and he'll tell us about their joint work with Kuznetsov about residual categories of Ersmanians. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be in this seminar. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Just a sec, I try to figure out how to... Yeah, the video. Yeah, okay, so, so it doesn't hide my slides from me. And, um, yeah, so let's, uh, I realize that this topic is, uh, I, some of you might have seen me speak about it and, uh, or maybe have seen Sasha speak about it. And I try to, to take maybe slightly different angle in this, in this talk. I hope it like maybe talk a bit more about quantum cohomology too. And I hope, uh, well, it makes sense in the end. And despite the fact that the talk is being recorded, I, I encourage you to ask me questions, interrupt at any point, and yeah, just just do it. Okay, so let's uh, let's start. So this is uh, the title. Based the talk is based on the joint work with Sasha Kuznetsov, and let's oops, let's uh, yeah. So let's uh, discuss first as a motivation and to put it kind of in a general perspective something called Dubrovin's conjecture. So maybe some of you are familiar with that, but let's recall. So our setting is we take X to be a smooth projective final variety over the complex numbers. And there is a conjecture by Boris Dubrovin stated at ICM in 98 that says the following, that the derived category of coherent sheaves, the bounded derived category has a full exceptional collection if and only if the big quantum cohomology of X is generically semi-simple. This is the first part. And then there are other parts of the conjecture that relate some kind of numerical invariants, like some Stokes matrices coming from the collection, uh, sorry, gram matrices of the collection are related to so-called Stokes matrices of some differential equations coming from quantum cohomology. And well, as a remark, so this conjecture can be motivated or explained by sufficiently optimistic formulations of the homological mirror symmetry. And uh, well, as you can see, we have this big quantum cohomology here. And usually, I mean, I don't have to recall what is a derived category in this seminar and also not what an exceptional collection is, but I would like to recall what this big quantum cohomology story is. So let's, let's, uh, let's talk about that for a while. So again, we start, we have X smooth projective final over the complex numbers, and we put additional assumptions, P car of X is Z, and there is no odd cohomology. This is not strictly speaking necessary, but just to simplify notation, we will do that. And uh, just a second. And uh, well, in this case, uh, the cohomology algebra is a finite dimensional commutative algebra. And well, how does the general story go? Well, we have something called Gino zero gram of written invariants. They allow you to deform the classical product on the cohomology and the deformed product is called quantum product. Let's be a bit more precise. Let's give a definition. So let's fix a graded basis of cohomology and dual linear coordinates. And it's customary in this business to, to set delta zero equal to the unit in the cohomology. And let's use for the cohomology classes, the Chow grading, let's divide all degrees by two, not to carry around all these necessary factors of two. And for variables ti, we set the degree to be one minus the degree of delta i. Also, we are going to need a variable q, whose degree we declare to be the index of our variety, which is the biggest integer, which divides the canonical class in integral cohomology. So with this, so with all these notation, we can, well, we need a bit more notation even then. Um, so we define something called gromov witten potential, which is a formal power series in these uh, variables T0, Ts, and it's defined by, by a formula like, that, like this. 
where these guys are so-called Gromov-Witten invariants. As you can see, this is a formal power series in Q. And so these individual numbers are called Gromov-Witten invariants, and they are supposed to count rational curves of degree D in X with some incidence conditions. But let's not worry about exactly what they are. So perhaps the important point here also is to say that we can put Q equal to one in the above formulas. So this is really not a formal power series, but rather a polynomial in Q because we assume that X is fun. But nonetheless, I'll, I'll keep Q in all the formulas just to keep track of the grading. But mentally, I put Q equal to one everywhere. And with respect to this grading defined on the previous slide, the potential F is homogeneous of degree three minus the dimension of X. And finally, we are arriving to our definition. So we define the big quantum cohomology of X to be the usual cohomology with tensor it with the formal power series. And then we define the product on the basis using the third derivatives of the potential. And this delta with the upper index is the dual basis of our original basis deltas with lower index dual with respect to the point characterization that we have on the cohomology. Well, this is like this very long definition of something called big quantum cohomology that appears in the formulation of the Brovin's conjecture. And as you can see, this is quite uh, involved. There is a simpler object that we are going to need to called small quantum cohomology. And you can understand it in two ways. So one way to, to define it is to say, okay, this is the quotient of the big quantum cohomology with respect to the ideal generated by the variables T0 to Ts. Or equivalently, you can say, well, in my definition, I give a similar definition, but I only use invariance with three insertions. I mean, like these three point correlators. And again, I'm setting Q equal to one everywhere. Well, that was a long definition. And uh, maybe some of you have already seen this and it makes sense. And if not, please don't hesitate to ask questions. So the, the small quantum cohomology is supposed to be the formation with respect to some linear subspace of the, of, so I, I mean, with respect to H2 variables in- right. Right. Well, so, can you, can you know, explain how is this related to molding out by the t t not up to t s? Right. So in the notation that I've set up, so this deformation is slightly hidden. It's like it would have been a deformation with respect to this parameter q. But because of my assumptions on the Picard, I can just plug in q equal to one without, so to speak, any loss of generality, because nothing really depends on this q. In, in this uh, particular setting. Does it, does it make sense? Since I cannot see the audience, uh, my screen is too small for that. So I, I don't know if the, the answer makes sense. Um, I, I suggest that you continue. I did not understand the answer, but uh, that's probably my fault. <laughs> now, what I, what I meant to say is like, you are right saying that small quantum cohomology deformation along H2, it's just, it's hidden here. Instead of taking the whole deformation, which would have been one dimensional with Q being the parameter, I set Q equal to one. So I'm taking just one uh, member of that family. Okay. I'm claiming that all the other members look the same. Thank you. Yeah, please ask more questions. I'm, I'm happy. All right, let's take an, let's consider an example and maybe it will also like help to answer this question a little bit more. And so this uh, example, the, the usual favorite example is of projective space. And we all know very well the presentation for the usual cohomology just generated by the hyperplane class and with this relation. And we see that the relation is in degree n plus one and the degree of Q in this case is also n plus one because the index of PN is n plus one. And because of all the homogeneity of this setup, we, we need to, simply find the homogeneous deformation of the original relation. And what is written here is up to a constant, the only possible deformation using the parameter Q 
of the original relation. And to figure out precisely that this constant, the minus one, one has to compute some Grom of written invariant, which in the end boils down to the fact that there is a unique line passing through two points in PM. And so this is small quantum cohomology of PM. I keep Q for to kind of to manifest the homogeneity, the grading, and I mentally set Q equal to one. I don't know if uh, if it helps to uh, clarify slightly that the previous question about uh, small quantum cohomology being parameterized by H two. But I it does. That... Thank you. Yeah. All right. So. Let's talk about one particular aspect of the story, namely the classical cohomology algebra is important. But the small quantum cohomology of PN, as we see in here, actually can be decomposed into a direct product of the co of copies of the ground field of the complex numbers, simply because this equation has n plus one solutions in the complex numbers. And so, in other words, uh, it has non important elements. So we see very different behavior between usual cohomology and small quantum cohomology. So let's uh, give some definitions in this direction. So in the Dubrovnik's okay. conjecture, we had generic sim. Can I ask, is it difficult to present the big quantum cohomology, let's say of P3 or something like this? Yeah, we're going to come to that in a second. Yeah, so maybe let me make this comment here. So in general, big quantum cohomology is very hard to to do anything about it. I mean, to have an explicit presentation because it involves, in principle, infinitely many non trivial invariants. So you will not be able to, so to speak, uh, most of the time to figure out all the numbers explicitly. So usually what you find in the literature is small quantum cohomology because for fun varieties, it's uh, just you need a finite number of data, like finite number of invariants that you need to compute. So let's talk now about this whole family. So we have, so I suggest we think about big quantum cohomology as a family of algebras parameterized by, by like a formal disk. There's a formal family, but let's not, not worry too much about it. Yeah, so we have, I've taken spec everywhere. So we have this formal family of finite dimensional algebras. So this is big quantum cohomology. And then when I specialize all parameters to zero, I get, small quantum cohomology, or I can take the generic for point of the base and do the base change. So work over the fraction field. And this is like the generic fiber. And this is the gadget that appears in the formulation of the Bruin's conjecture. And uh, here's my picture like uh, for that. So this parabola is like the total this spec of this uh, big quantum cohomology it projects to a line, for example. And then over the origin, so to speak, I have this, this point, which will give me a non-reduced, something non-reduced in the small quantum cohomology, whereas the generic fiber would still have two points. And so what I'm trying to say here is that you may have something generically semi-simple, like on this picture, but the, I mean, the big quantum cohomology can be generically semi-simple, but at the same time, the small quantum cohomology will have nil potent. Yeah. So we give a definition. We say that big quantum cohomology is generically semi-simple if this generic fiber is a semi-simple algebra, which means that it's a product of fields. And the remark which I just said in words already is that if the small quantum cohomology is semi-simple, then the big quantum cohomology is generically semi-simple, which means that if the central fiber is a bunch of reduced points, then if you deform this picture a little bit, you cannot get any nilipotence. So everything stays reduced. But you can also kind of prove it formally, but the converse is false. And the false because of, of the picture that we see, like something like this parabola can happen in practice easily. Okay, so let's, let's keep going. Um, so, what does it tell us all this all this story? So let's come back to the original Dubrovin's conjecture. Let's recall the statement. The statement is that the derived category has a full exceptional collection 
if and only if the big quantum cohomology is generically semi-simple. And now in some sense, like this reminds me of the question that Gany already asked. Well, where do we want to go from here? Well, the first thing is that we have very little understanding of, about the big quantum cohomology in general, because it's uh, extremely hard to compute in practice. And essentially there is very little knowledge about it. Second, we understand the small quantum cohomology much better. There are lots of examples studied in the literature, something like homogeneous spaces, toric varieties, like many, many things have been studied. So there is lots of um, supply of interesting examples. And so we can ask a question, can we use the structure of the small quantum cohomology to make some finer conjectures about the bio derived category? Right, so in the, in Dubrovin's conjecture, you have big quantum cohomology being generically semi-simple is equivalent to derived category having a full exceptional collection. But maybe like if we work here with the small quantum cohomology instead, we maybe can kind of predict something perhaps slightly finer than just having any collection. And well, sort of an answer to this question is that Lefschetz collections seem to work very well to answer questions of this kind. And basically the purpose of my talk is to try to give an idea what this means and illustrate in some examples. Okay, so uh, let's, let's recall what exceptional uh, Lefschetz collections are. Well, I decided not to recall what exceptional collections are. Do I need to recall that? Please, please tell me if I need to recall that. So there is nothing. So I assume that everybody is familiar with exceptional collections. And so I'm just recalling what Lefschetz collections are. But in principle, I can write on my tablet here. And so you just, you can recall the definition of exceptionality too. So Lefschetz collections is a special type of exceptional collections introduced by Kuznetsov around 2006 in his work on homological projective duality. So let me recall what this means. So we have X, smooth projective, or like Fano as before we can assume, and we fix an ample line bundle of one on it. And a Lefschetz collection with respect to this of one is an exceptional collection that has the following block structure. So we start with, with a bunch of, like with the beginning of a collection called starting block. And then I throw away some objects at the end of this collection and twist the rest by O of one and keep going. So essentially the collection is defined by, by this starting block and, and these numbers sigma called the support partition, which determine how many objects in the end of which block I need to throw away to, to pass to the next block. And if all the blocks have the same lens, then the Lefschetz collection is called rectangular. Okay, so maybe probably many of you, if not all of you have seen this before, but uh, just in case, let's do a couple of examples to, to illustrate. Let's take the Bellinson collection on PM. Then as a starting block, it just consists of O of the structure sheaf and the support partition is just one, 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 one. So we don't throw away anything. We just twist everything that we have. And I use semicolons to, to separate blocks. So this all blocks have the same length. So the collection is rectangular. Now let's do G24. And let's take Caprana's collection for the G24. So in this case, we have the starting block consisting of three bundles, O U star and symmetric square O U star, where U is the tautological subbundle. Then in the second block, we have thrown away the symmetric square and twisted everything that was left by it. one. And in the last block, I have also thrown away U star and twisted one more time by O of one. And so this collection is defined by the starting block U O U star symmetric square U star and has support partition three to one. And in fact, in this example, you can make the starting block even smaller. Let's do another example. 
Uh, namely, it's enough to take O and U star, but then of course we have to modify the support partition. Namely, we can take two, two, one, one, which means that I take O and U star, then I twist both of them by one, and then I get rid of the U star and just keep O and twist. And Lefschetz collections, which have the smallest possible starting block, are called minimal. And this notion can be properly defined. So this is a, this is okay. So I can, I can ask for Grassmannian to sure. four to four. So supposedly all full exception collections are in the same orbit of under mutations, right? But it's not known in general. Like this two, yeah, for example. I they, I'm not sure if it is known even in this case. Ah, whether they differ by mutations. Ah, no, no. I, I mean, uh, so what I mean, like in general, if, if for G24 they differ by mutation, in this case, uh, but also on top of my head, I don't know for these two collections, but uh, yeah, this probably one can try to figure out. It's just exceptional collections, they are uh, related by mutations. But as Lepschitz, they are very different, right? As Lepschitz, these two collections are very different. Yeah, so they have uh, like, well, for us, the important thing is that this, the, the pattern of how things get twisted by O of one, as we will see in a few minutes, is, is very different in a sense. Like here we have, we start with three objects and then we throw away one of them and then we throw away another one. And here is we- uh -huh. Is it clear that there is no, uh, how you call it, starting block of two, but with partition two, two, two? Uh, I don't think it is a priori. But in this for, for, there are, there are, I think there are no general reasons to ex exclude that. And, uh, but I don't know like an example where of an example of a collection in this case where this is indeed the the, uh, the pattern. Okay. So let's uh, define what is a residual category of a Lefschetz collection. Um, well, as before, we start with the Lefschetz collection. So it's defined by the starting block and then this this uh, sequence of integers that defines the pattern uh, how you throw away things and we can take its rectangular part meaning that i take only those objects which appear in all blocks and we define the residual category just to be the orthogonal to that so in the end we have such a semi-orthogonal decomposition i have this rectangular part and then I, I've taken the orthogonal on this side. So let's let's illustrate this in examples. Oh yeah, there is a remark that the residual category is zero if and only if the collection is full and rectangular. So let's let's do an example. Let's take our example G24. And let's take the second collection, the, uh, this, the, the very last collection, which we saw. And there, the rectangular part is just structure shift and it twists. And so what is left, so to speak, are these objects that are highlighted in red, this, the tautological bundle and its twist. And so basically, automatically we get a, an exceptional collection in the residual category consisting of mutations of of these uh, of these bundles and well this is just saying that uh, it's a general feature that if i mutate these objects these objects which are not in the rectangular part into the residual category then they give us a collection there and the interesting feature that happens in this example is the following that well like I said, automatically we get an exceptional pair. So X from P to A is zero, but the surprising behavior is that also X from A to B is zero. And this means that A and B are completely orthogonal. 
for which there was no a priori reason. And basically, this is the message of my talk. Like it, from from my point of view, so to speak, the interest in these residual categories is is in this interesting behavior. And it is not always like this that objects become completely orthogonal. I'm going to show you some other examples. So let's do another example, which was also a starting example for me in a way, so-called symplectic isotropic Grassmannian 2.6. Let's not worry about what this variety is precisely. This is what I just said. And a minimal Lefschetz collection for this guy has been constructed by Kuznetsov about 2005. And it looks like this. So it is on the slide. And so the objects which are not in the rectangular part, I highlighted in red. And if you do the same, you mutate them into the residual category and you compute the X, you'll get the following pattern for the X groups. Namely, there is only one non-trivial X, which is of dimension one. And this implies that the residual category is equivalent to the category of representations of the A2 quiver. And again, a priori, there was no reason for that. If we have taken these two bundles here as they were and compute the X between them from, from left to right, then it will be some big vector space uh, whose dimension we could in theory compute if we wanted to, but it will be some big number. But if you project them into the residual category, then suddenly you get very small X in this example. And in fact, you conclude that it's the A2 quiver. And now I want to tie this back to quantum cohomology and explain a little bit why this matches perfectly with what happens in the quantum cohomology in this example. So let's, let's do the small quantum cohomology of IG26. Like I said, for homogeneous spaces, and in particular for this example, uh, quantum small quantum cohomology is very well studied in the literature. And here is what the literature tells us. It's a theorem, a particular case of a theorem by Buch, Kresch, and Tamvakis from 2009, that the small quantum cohomology has the following presentation. So it's generated by four variables, which stand for the special Schubert classes, and four relations. And here are the relations. And there is no point in memorizing them, just some relations. What is important here is the following, is that the, the origin in these coordinates, by which I mean the point sigma i, all sigma i's are equal to zero, is a solution of this system of equations. And, and again, I, I have here the variable q, but I mentally put q equal to one. I just keep here for the grading purposes. So Q is of degree five in this case, sigma i of degree i. So this term has degree six, and this also has degree six, and this has degree six. So everything is homogeneous. And so what is so interesting about this example is, is it's the structure of this algebra. Namely, let's discuss it. So this algebra is not semi-simple, which means it has nilpotent elements. And let me show you what they are, or what is the structure of these nilpotent elements. Well, how can we see that? Well, in fact, it's very simple in this case, even though one must confess that we are a bit lucky. So we view this as the algebra of functions on the finite set inside C4, on, like maybe of fat points. So I'm taking the spectrum of this algebra, in other words. And then the origin, as I already said, is a solution of the system. And so we can just compute this risky tangent at that point by looking at the linear terms. And, and it happens to be of dimension one. But the scheme itself is zero dimensional because the algebra is finite dimensional. So this point, the origin, is not a smooth point of this, of this uh, scheme. And so we have nilpotent. So it's, uh, it's some fat point. And in fact, we can show that this algebra decomposes into the following product. You have, in total, it's dimension felt, and you have 10 copies of the ground field and one copy of the dual numbers, which corresponds to this fat point at the origin that we just discovered. 
with this tangent space computation. And maybe those of you who are a bit familiar with singularity theory would recognize that this is the Milner algebra or the Jacobi algebra of the A2 singularity. And in fact, this is not a coincidence. I mean, remember that A2 query that appeared in the derived category two slides ago, this is the same A2. And uh, this connection goes via Fukai's idol categories and mirror symmetry. And I'm going to try to explain this a little bit. I'm sorry, isn't it uh -huh. A1 singularity? Uh, so, so A2 singularity is defined by the polynomial x cubed or epsilon cubed. And if I take the derivative, I'll get a square. And so the Milner algebra is defined That's by the derivative. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So A1 singularity is like their Milner algebras, they are just uh, the ground field, so they are reduced. So you can say that these are the A1 singularities. Um, Right, so to state uh, our precise conjectures about the structure of derived category and small quantum cohomology, we're going to need some notation. So let me introduce that notation. And uh, well, as you have seen, we have to look at the structure of small quantum cohomology. And so let's define this quantum spectrum to be just the usual spec of this finite dimensional algebra. And then this uh, resulting finite scheme comes with a mu m action where m is the index of our variety. And this has to do with the fact that before putting q equal to one, everything was z graded. But if we put q equal to one, everything becomes z mod mz graded. And so z mod mz, I call here mu. So we have this uh, action. And uh, also, we have the anti-canonical class in cohomology. And uh, as a vector space, small quantum cohomology is the same thing. And so I get a map from the quantum spectral to the affine line. And this map, again, for general reasons, is a mu m equivariant with respect to the standard action of on A1. And finally, we want to distinguish between the points which lie in the pre-image of zero under this map and all other points. So like zero fiber over the of this map versus all other fibers. And maybe a remark for, for those of you who like landau gisburg models, and you should think like this, uh, the scheme QSX, this quantum spectrum, you should think of it as the critical locus of your landau ginzburg model. And for this, probably you should assume that all the critical points of your landau ginzburg model are isolated. And the map, and this map corresponds to just the map defined by the landau ginzburg potential restricted to its critical locus. So this is the picture, so to speak. We don't have an explicit landau ginzburg model, but we can read off all we need from by looking at the small quantum cohomology. And now we can uh, we can state uh, the conjecture that we have is that is the following is that well let's restate fun a variety of index m in our previous assumptions and let's assume that we have generically semi-simple big quantum cohomology so that according to Dubrovin's conjecture we can in principle expect uh, to have some full exceptional collection in the derived category. Then we make the following slightly finer predictions about the structure of the derived category. Namely, well, we say that there exists an exceptional collection of in the derived category of length k, where k is the length of this of this scheme divided by m. So, so recall from the previous slide, this was all the points of which were not in the central fiber. So the, the locus, which was outside the central fiber, and we divide it by M, by the index. So we think morally that this part corresponds to the rectangular part of the collection. 
And second part, the residual category of this collection, which means like I have this rectangular part and I just take the orthogonal. And this is what I call residual category here. It has a completely orthogonal decomposition into pieces R sigma, uh, R zeta. So uh, zeta. No, it, this letter is called xi, right? So sorry, R xi, where xi is uh, R points of this central fiber of the map defined by the anti-canonical class. I mean, closed points, in principle, they can be non-reduced by it. Like they can index the components and and the, the each individual component is generated by an exceptional collection whose length is prescribed by the uh, kind of the corresponding algebra at that point C. And uh, sure, QS well, is a small quantum cohomology, right? Can you say it again, please? What is QS? So, so we took small quantum cohomology and okay. took its spectrum. As a as an like as a ring. So let's, let's go back one slide to the setting just to recall the notation and then I come back. So we we take the small quantum. It's, it's okay, I understand. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just notation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah, a lot of notation which unfortunately disappears uh, when the slide is changed. Okay, so okay. All right, uh, and uh, yeah, so. Well, there is this conjecture now. What is the evidence for this conjecture? Or maybe first we we uh, discuss some remarks about the statement. Namely, let's uh, let's recall what we had in our examples before. Well, first the the kind of the simplest possible case, in a way, is when the small quantum cohomology is semi simple, and in this case, this this uh, like the central fiber. It consists of reduced points, and automatically the residual category should be generated by a completely orthogonal exceptional collection whose objects are indexed by the closed points of the central fiber. Right, let's go back. So, so in this semi simple case, each piece is just generated by one object, and we say that this so these components are completely orthogonal. So, this is just a specialization of this statement. And this is this is happens, uh, for example, for the ordinary Grassmannians, where we know that the small quantum cohomology is semi simple. It is not quite true that we know uh, this conjecture in this case, but I will tell more uh, what is known about that for Grassmannians. But what about these compo these individual components, R, C? because the conjecture on the previous page didn't say anything about them. Well, in general, one expects these components to be equivalent to the Fukai Zeidel category of the corresponding critical point of, the, of some Landau-Ginsburg model for our variety. And uh, so it's, as such is not very precise what, what I'm saying here, but at least if you have some Landau-Ginsburg model, then you might uh, have a guess what to expect. And in some cases, uh, you, you can even get this expectation without it, without the landau ginsburg model, <clears throat> namely, namely for so-called co-joint varieties, which is also this IG26, which we had before. It's a particular example. So this is a special type of homogeneous spaces, G mod P. And in each Dinkin type, there exists, there exists exactly one variety, or, which is called co-adjoint, whatever the precise definition is. And let me just show you in classical Dinkin types what they are in types B, C, D. So in type B, it's, these are the usual quadrics. In type CN, we have uh, symplectic isotropic Grassmannians of two planes. And in type DN, we have orthogonal Grassmannians of two planes. And in this example, we have the following feature is that the central fiber of quantum cohomology has just one point, and this point quite often happens to be non-reduced point. And with this Foucault's ideal uh, intuition, it is natural to expect the following to be true, namely that the residual category 
has just one component. This is part of the conjecture on the previous slide. But moreover, this component is in fact equivalent to the representations of some quiver. And what is the quiver? And the quiver has the following funny description, namely, you should take the Dinkin diagram of your group G, which defines your homogeneous space. So for example, CN in, uh, in the example IG2 to N. And then you should take the subdiagram of short roots. And so for CN, you get A N minus one. And recall that for IG26, we had C3. And so you should get A2. And this is exactly what we had in the example for a few slides ago. And uh, yeah. So are there any questions about the formulation and these remarks? Short roots, uh, was that length two? So, let, let, so the short roots, so let's, so I can draw on my slides. So, uh, so let's draw the Duncan diagram in this case. So for CN, I'll draw it here. So we have, so Duncan diagram looks like this. And the short roots are those which where the arrow is pointing, right? So, so where what? Where this arrow is pointing, like oh, so sorry, maybe it's not very. So this is a, in the Dinkin diagram. If it's non simply laced, you have an arrow that shows which roots are shorter or longer, right? So, so in this case, you just all all roots are short, right? Can you say it again, please? If it's a simply laced diagram, yeah. All if it's simply laced, short. then all roots have the same length, and so you you say that they are all short, or they are both short and long. But the point is that we take all of them. Yeah, yeah. So in, in the example here, so for B n, you just have so the 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 arrow is the opposite arrow, so you just get a one always. For C n, you get a n minus one, and for D n, you just get D n back. Right. Does it make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So this is the formulation. And uh, well, basically, I'm, I'm almost at the end of my slides. And basically, I have one more slide left where I'm summarizing what we know about, like, about particular cases of this conjecture, what we can prove. And uh, so let's, let's discuss this. So let's erase this Lincoln diagram. So what do we know? What can we prove? Well, let's first talk about the case of semi-simple quantum cohomology. This is also that, for example, for this Grassmannian 2-4 that we considered earlier, this is the case. So for GKN, so either if K and N are co-prime or and then in this case, the correct collection is just rectangular and there is essentially nothing to prove. Or if k is a prime number and n is divisible by this prime number. So in these cases, we using Fonarev's Lefschetz collections for Grassmannians, we, we managed to uh, check the conjecture. And we expect that it holds in general for, for these collections of Fonarev, but uh, the combinatorics becomes very complicated. So we have not been able to prove this yet. Well, for quadrics, it follows Rob Kapranov's work. And from, I mean, and uh, for orthogonal Grassmannians 2 to n plus 1, again, the collections here are rectangular. So it also, like the residual category is zero, but still everything fits very nicely. And this is the Kuznetsov construction of collections. And uh, so there are also some sporadic examples which do not fit into families. Namely, there is G2 mod P2, this homogene some homogeneous space in type G2. Again, rectangular collection in this case, constructed by Kuznetsov. So there is isotropic Grassmannian 3A by Lala Gusiva. Uh, isotropic Grassmannian 310 by Sasha Novikov. 
Then there is a Cayley plane E6 mod P1, which is a combination of uh, results of Faenzi Manivel and my joint work with Peter Belmont and Sasha Kuznetsov. And also for the isotropic Grassmannians 4, 8, and 5, 10, they should also follow from what is known from the works of Polishuk and Samokin and Fonarev, but as far as I know, it is not written down anywhere. I think the case of the first case, G2 over P2, was uh, my student, Maxim Razin, who constructed the collection. This may very well be the case. Hmm? This, this may very well be the case. I remember we, I think, even talked about it at some point. But mm -hmm. uh, I think I either could not or did not find a reference. I don't know if he has written anything about that. But uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, he wrote his diploma thesis. And uh, uh, there is one more example uh, in type F4. So called a joint Grassmannian in type of four by myself. But, sorry, but he, did, he didn't prove that the, the collection is full. I mean, but probably back then there was no notion of Lefschetz collections, but I believe that probably what he constructed was Lefschetz anyway. Yeah, yeah, it was Lefschetz. And, uh, it was just yeah. two, line bun, uh, two vector bundles and then it's twisted by, by, by two, uh, I mean, two by three. So like appropriate them. twists, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, right, and so we have one more example in type F4, where the collection is also rectangular. So no interesting, like the residual category is simply zero. But but say in, in these examples, there are some, the residual category should be generated by completely orthogonal objects. And this is indeed the case. So in this, in this, in these examples, this should be, they are more interesting from that perspective. So is it proven that in all these cases, the collections are full? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, so, so I think for G2 mod P2, it was Kuznetsov, and as, as written, exactly. So for E6 mod P1, many very files constructed collections. Certainly I remember from, that, um, sorry for interrupting. No, no, no worries, I mean, please go ahead. Horizon didn't prove that it's a full collection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fullness is a, well, I mean, as you know very well, that is a hard part of this business, at least with the current technology. Yeah, so yeah, in this case, also fullness is known by Fancy and Manivel, and we just computed uh, the residual category here. And All what right. was it for E6? Can you say it again? What was the residual category for E6? So there are two objects. So again, in this case, the small quantum cohomology is semi-simple. So you expect residual category to be generated by completely orthogonal objects. And in this case, I think there are two of them. Oh no, sorry, three, three of them. So you found this Can you say it again, please? So you found these three objects and proved that they are orthogonal, right? No, not quite. So we have taken the collection, the Lefschetz collection constructed by Fancy and Manivet. So it's a Lefschetz collection. So in this case, you have, uh, well, I hope I remember it correctly. I think you have index 11. You have index 11 and you have a rectangular part, uh, which is generated by two objects. So you have like 22 objects. And then you have uh, three more, like you have another object in the first writing block and it appears with three twists. I mean, like it object itself and then twisted by O of one and O of two. And so if you kind of compute the mutations of these objects, into the residual category, you can um, compute the, the X between them and you see that they are completely orthogonal. So essentially we computed this. this. That, does it make sense? 
I didn't follow. Did you check that they are orthogonal or not? Yes, 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 absolutely. So, so we check that they give completely orthogonal uh, object. Yeah. So the the mutations of of the of of the extra objects which are not in the in the rectangular part mutated into the residual category. They are completely orthogonal. Okay. And maybe let me mention a couple of examples where which are not semi-simple, which we know. Namely, this is the example of isotropic Grassmannian 2 to n, which we already discussed a little bit. So the collections and the mutations were computed by, by Sasha Kuznetsov. And you get the cleaver a n minus one. And for the isotropic, uh, for the orthogonal Grassmannian 2 to n, this is a joint work with Sasha, and we get the expected quiver dn, like I explained on the previous slide, that we should expect the quiver, which is given by the short roots of the diagram. But since we are in type dn, everything is short. And so we just get dn. And uh, excuse me, by isotropic, you mean skew symmetric form? So he, this is skew symmetric, and this is symmetric. OK. And uh, we know one more example, which is sort of isolated, namely in type F4, the, uh, the so-called co-joint again variety in type F4. And this is a follow, it is a subject of the same joint work with Peter Bellman and Sasha Kuznetsov. And so there we, in type F4, let's, let's do again this, uh, let's do this di diagram in type F4. Since we have, I guess, still a few minutes time. Uh, do I draw? For some reason, I cannot write on my slide anymore. Can anybody else write on my slide? Maybe it's just I, I couldn't do it before. Yeah, I don't know how to do it. But anyway, I don't know why, but some, for some reason, I, it, it doesn't, maybe it's just my, oh yeah, now it's working. So I think it just was my tablet was hanging out. So now it's okay. So, so let, let's do it in, in, uh, in F4. So the Dinkin diagram. Looks like this. And now we have to think which way the arrow goes. And I, uh, right now, I don't remember on top of my head, but it's either goes one way or the other way, but it's here. So it's either, either like this or like this. But for our answer, it will not matter because either way, if we take the short route, so let's, so let's just, so that then we would just get, oh, what happened? Yeah, this drawing is not working very well somehow, but so, so with this uh, arrow, we would get these two, and so we would get A2. And this is exactly what we get. So in this last example, we get uh, the, the residual category is equivalent to the representations of the quiver of type A2. I'm sorry, the first light uh, vertex is not uh, short root. So let me quickly check uh, the uh, F4, which way the, the arrow goes. And then we, and I, I, I'm using my laptop for the slide, so I cannot really do it efficiently, but uh, maybe try it on my phone. And yeah, so I actually had the arrow in the right direction, surprisingly. So let me put it in the right place. Oh. So it says that 
the first so the diagram tells us that the first two roots are longer than the third and the fourth root. So if we take the short roots, what is left is the third vertex and the fourth vertex. And so we get a cleaver of type A2. And this is what we see also in the derived category and in the quantum cohomology. Yeah, well, I guess I should stop here. And thank you all for the patience. And if you have more questions, I'm happy to, to answer them, of course. OK, thanks. Uh, OK, so we thank uh, Maxim virtually. So let's, uh, yeah. Uh, so any, any questions for Maxim? Any other questions? Yeah, I still have a question. Please, Sorry. please go ahead. I'm happy to. Uh, you said for Grassmannians, mm -hmm. you don't have, I mean, all objects are orthogonal, right? So we can prove it in, in uh, so under these well, assumptions I mean, on K and If you expect this, right? Or not? Yeah, we expect this to be, yeah. I didn't understand why, because you said you sh you take the diagram of short roots. No, this diagram of short roots only short for co-adjoint varieties. Ah, it's only for co-adjoint. Yeah, so ah. for co-adjoint varieties, somehow this is very kind of funny uh, thinking diagram type prediction works. I see. So in general, you don't know what is this residue category? So in general, uh, we don't have like a general prediction what to expect for a G mod P. It is more like case by case. You take the known presentation from the literature, and then you analyze what's going on, what kind of uh, non-reduced points you have. And this fact, this, this Dinkin diagram uh, story, I mean, with the short roots, it's a part of a joint work with Nicola Piran, where we analyze what's happening in the in the quantum small quantum cohomology of co-joint varieties. And we accidentally, so to speak, discovered this fact by just doing it case by case in all the Dinkin types. And the small quantum cohomology in these cases has already been previously studied by, by Nicola and, and his uh, co-authors, I mean, more precisely by Chaput and Nicola Peran, they have studied small quantum cohomology of adjoint and co-adjoint varieties. How, how about minuscule varieties? Minuscule varieties, they, they uh, well, I mean, uh, for them, the small quantum cohomology is semi-simple. And so they would uh, fall into this first uh, category on this slide, but cases with the semi-simple small quantum cohomology. Mm. So residue category should be orthogonal? Yeah, it uh, should be generated by completely orthogonal collection. For example, this Cayley plane, which is uh, mentioned on the slide, it's, uh, it's an example of that. Mm -hmm. But this behavior is not, uh, so to speak, reduced to uh, minuscule cases because like this IG38 or 310, they are not uh, neither minuscule nor co-minuscule. They are something, but they still have the same behavior. There's a question from Arendt in the chat. Are there any examples for non-homogeneous varieties? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, at present, all our examples tend to be homogeneous. But it would be very interesting to have more also non-homogeneous examples. But yeah, at present, I have to say no. All our examples with interesting uh, properties are homogeneous. Probably you could do tor something toric. So lots of things should be yeah. known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one should, uh, one should definitely try toric things. So like when you go into higher PK rank, you have to be slightly more careful what you're doing. So what I explained today was uh, PK rank one. And this kind of, it's very, I mean, you don't have to think too much, so to speak, in a way, like about what you, where, which way you are going. So if your PK rank is higher, you have to be careful what you do about quantum parameters and in small quantum cohomology. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, example of what? I mean, you have, you have an exceptional collection on V22, it's six dimensional family and the generic uh, variety there. 
is not homogeneous, right? Yes, but the pattern for V22, if I remember correctly, so it's index uh, one. one. Am, I, am I mistaken? Index one? Yeah, yeah, index one. So you'll have, to, I mean, there'll, like it will be an example of, of, of this, but perhaps not very interesting in the sense that like you would not get some interesting residual category, which kind of give you more manifestation for the conjecture. So in, in, in V22, I believe you have a, like, a, um, I mean, there, like if you have index one, then essentially everything is just your first block and like you don't see any, any like additional symmetries which you would like to, uh, like uh, uh, between which you would like to see the parallel between quantum cohomology and derived category. That doesn't Very make sense what I'm saying. Yeah. So we like more interesting are examples with higher index so that you can really see like these orbits in of critical points or in this quantum cohomology correspond to the same thing in derived category under the action of O of one, like in these Lefschetz collections. But yeah, perhaps the short answer to, to the Arendt's question is uh, unfortunately not yet, but that would be very interesting for us. So yeah, okay, thanks. So any any more questions? So we plan to consider uh, to continue discussion in Gather Town. Maxim, can you come for for a short for a little sure, while? Sure, yeah, I will come. So as you explained, I just need to click on the link so 